Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Luke's Lutheran Church, where spirits come alive. I am Pastor Janet Crotz, Director of Family Ministry. Pastor Linda is on a trip, a mission trip, to Pakistan, along with Caitlin Curry, Pastor Dan, her husband, and several members of First Presbyterian Church in Garland. We will keep them in our prayers until they return February 6th. A warm welcome to visitors and guests who are with us today, and a warm welcome to all of those who are streaming or watching our uh, service online. We were planning at this point in time to welcome Pastor Jim Rowe, who is the uh, pastor at the Lutheran Campus Ministry in Denton. However, he's not here, so uh, you can welcome me. <laughs> Please fill out the attendance slip in your bulletin and you can put it in the offering plate. And if you're streaming, you can give us a shout out on Facebook or some other messaging way. Um, guests, please leave your contact information so we can take you out for coffee. And those who are streaming, please leave your contact information so Pastor Linda can meet with you for coffee or on Zoom. We will serve Holy Communion this morning. More instructions will come at that time. All are invited to Jesus' table, no matter your background, your current church status, your previous church status, you are welcome at Jesus' table. Those who are at home, please get a piece of bread or cracker and some juice or wine to join us in the sacrament. We invite you to stay after church today for one hour um, for our faith formation hour. Uh, it's also, it's our education so please grab snacks and uh, coffee in the gathering area, and adults can go to the uh, adult education room, also known as the Ed Lyson room, and we'll listen to an interesting, hopefully, discussion class about finding peace and love in the Bible and in our world. We have nursery care until, for that entire hour, and supervision for our elementary kids who will have a fellowship time and play time. We remember the family of Soham Salim, our youth director, at the death of her uncle uh, late this week. So if you will please keep them in your prayers and today the youth can either join the adult class or go to the youth room and just hang out. Imagine that. I believe that is all of the announcements. Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, our uh, dear friend Ted Bender passed away this week, uh, late, actually late last week, and uh, his service is still pending. They're waiting to see when the folks from out of town can come. And now we'll move to confession and forgiveness. Will you please stand in body or spirit? God is gracious and merciful and knows our needs even before they reach our lips. Confident of God's love, let us make our confession first in silent prayers. God who searches us and knows us, we come to be loved and accepted, but admit that we are afraid. We confess the hurt we feel inside that has nowhere to go. We crave your deep peace, but wonder if we are worthy. We draw near to you and then resist openness, healing, being changed. Touch our hearts and transform us, O oh God. Restore your light and vision within our souls and make us whole. Trusting your grace, we earnestly pray. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Friends in Christ, hear this good news 
and experience the grace of God as one washed clean in the waters of baptism. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, fully embraced and made whole. You are free to shine like the stars and live in the light of love. Thanks be to God. Amen. The forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God, and the light of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray together. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, now I invite all of the children, youth, and everyone young at heart to come and join me up here. Here comes Bryn and Sayel and Natalie and Ashley and Eleanor. Hi, Ellie. Hi. I'm so glad you were all here today. And I don't have to hold on to the mic, because I've got one now. Say, I'm so glad to see you back. Are you feeling better? Good. Good. All right. Well, this part of the church year is called Epiphany. Can we say that? Epiphany. Can you say Epiphany, Say? Ah, Epiphany. There she goes. And Eleanor is demonstrating what Epiphany means. What does Epiphany mean? I don't know, right? Epiphany means revealing, seeing something that nobody knew about. So what happened at Christmas that nobody knew about? At first, nobody knew about it. <gasps> A baby was born. A baby was born, and they put the baby in a manger. And who was that baby? Jesus. Sayel knows. That baby was Jesus. And so who found out about it? Who came to visit Jesus? First, the guys that were out in the field and the angels came to them. Those were the... Come on, y'all. They were out in the field tending their flock. <laughs> the angels came to them, the... Shepherds, right. Okay, the shepherds. And then who else found out about it, Ashley? The kings. The kings, the three magi, right? So they came and they, sorry, I'm shifting gears as we speak. And they came and they uh, found out about the Jesus. How did they find out about Jesus? How did they know where he was? They followed the Star, right? They followed the star, and they went to see Jesus. And then what did they do? What did they do that Eleanor's doing right now? What did they do? They talked about it. They talked. Jesus was revealed to them. It was an epiphany that this wonderful, different person had been born, that there was a new birth to celebrate. And so those magi went home, which for Eleanor is back there by her mom, and they told everybody they saw about this wonderful thing that had happened. And they lived far away. They lived in a different country. So they went to the different country, and they told everybody about Jesus. And then what did those people do? What did those people in all the different countries do when they found about this revealing of God come to live on earth as Jesus? They just went home and made bread and swept the floor. And <coughs> Now what did they do? Come on, youth group. Look, elders still at it. They told people. They told people, and they told people, and some of the people they told were their sons and daughters. They're young folks, and they told people, and they told people, and so who knows now? Who knows about Jesus now? I do. Yeah, we all know about Jesus now. How about you folks? Y'all know about Jesus? All right. See? Because they told people. So what can we do for Jesus? Tell people. Tell people. Yay. 
Yay! We can tell. Look, there goes Eleanor to run and tell her mom, <laughs> Pastor Janet's telling a story about Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah! Okay, so yeah, you and Bryn and whoever of y'all want to can go to Luke's Learners now. Guess what? Guess what? My birthday's 10 days before Christmas. Oh, yeah? Your birthday is before Christmas. I know. I remember that. And you turned six, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. of your hands of faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, because they are God in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this is coming with an understanding. God's praise and truth forever. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might not, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life.
The Holy Gospel according to uh, St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. So as you all know, uh, first impressions say a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I apologize for being late. I headed, there's like, 50 1210 Beltline roads in the, <laughs> in the Metroplex. And I got, yeah, anyways. So, my name is Jim. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I am the, the pastor for Lutheran Campus Ministry up in Denton. Uh, what else do you want to know about me? Uh, I've been a pastor now for for 16 years. I have served congregations in Michigan, Connecticut, New York, uh, uh, nursing home here in Texas, and now uh, Lutheran Campus Ministry. I do not enjoy long walks on the beach. Um, I've got two daughters uh, and uh, an amazing wife of 20 years, um, at which point you say, wow, you don't look like you should have been married that long. You don't look old enough, and I'll say thank you. Um, I know what it's like when a guest preacher shows up, because being in specialized ministry, I'm usually where you all are, and when a guest preacher shows up, it's kind of like when a substitute teacher shows up and you're in middle school or you're in high school, right? You can kind of just tune things out and just kind of go through the motions and everything. And, and that's, that's, I understand that. I'm the same way. Um, I'm not Pastor Linda, and in all likelihood, you won't remember my name in a few hours. Jim. It's Jim. Um, that's okay. That's okay. What I do want you to remember, though, uh, from this <laughs> really awkward first impression is the importance of the work that Lutheran Campus Ministry in Denton does on behalf of the entire church with our, our, pa- our partner, the Denton Wesley Foundation. Together, we provide a safe space for LGBTQ uh, students at the University of North Texas and TWU uh, to explore their faith. We provide free lunch and dinner on Thursdays each week of the school year as well as a food pantry, and we provide multiple uh, worship and Bible study options throughout each week. What we do matters because most university students in Denton have had negative experiences with religious groups and street, street preachers every week. Wednesdays, uh, I'm gonna say this, I mean, we've already ruined first impressions already, right? Wednesdays on the University of North Texas are fondly known, fondly known, as Damnation Wednesdays. You go to different parts of the University of North Texas campus and you can uh, interact with a street preacher, whether you like it or not, who is saying you're going to go to hell in a handbasket, and it doesn't matter who you are. So we're trying to change that. We're trying to change people's religious experiences on these university campuses in, the, in Denton. 
So first impressions are incredibly important. Instead of a clerical collar, I walk around campus with a t-shirt on that says, this pastor loves you. Or while I'm grilling burgers on a Thursday night out on the street, I wear a, an apron that says, judgment-free Christianity. Or uh, sometimes I will actually sit outside the University of North Texas Union uh, with a big sign next to me that says, rant to me about religion and I'll listen. Because I want people to know that there is an alternative Christianity that isn't all about judgment and wrath. And that first impression is so incredibly important. They grab your attention, right, these first impressions. And you can tell a lot about the theme of each of our four Gospels in the Bible by the first act of public ministry Jesus does in each of them. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' first act is to go up to the top of a mountain and teach a new interpretation of the law that we today call the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is that great teacher, the new Moses. In John's Gospel, Jesus' first act is to show up at a wedding party where the wine has run out and he turns water into wine. Six jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, filled to the brim with the best wine anybody had ever tasted when the party was getting kind of lame. <laughs> Jesus is God in the flesh in John's Gospel who brings the power of creation and the abundance of God to the people around him. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown, and preaches a sermon during the Sabbath worship where he names God's love for the poor and the oppressed as the focus of his ministry and maybe not so much focusing on the people, the Jewish people. And his words create such a stir that his childhood friends and neighbors try to throw him off a cliff. Please, there's no cliffs around here. Please, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus is the Son of God who associates with and cares for the hungry, the poor, the disenfranchised, the oppressed, and cares not if it harms him to say it. But Mark? Oh, I love Mark. Jesus, the exorcist. I'm surprised sometimes that Hollywood hasn't kind of picked up on this story. I mean, his presence in a movie can be a bit of a downer, right? I mean, he's always wearing a bathrobe, the long hair, the weird sash, like a beauty queen. But I mean, if they can turn Hansel and Gretel into uh, witch hunters, then they could probably turn Jesus into a prequel of that great 1970s horror movie, The Exorcist, right? Uh, but anyways, I digress. Um, the gospel writers understood that what you do reflects your priorities. That your actions reflect who you are at your very core. So everything Jesus does in Matthew reflects Jesus as the new Moses. Every, everything Jesus does in John's gospel reflects Jesus as the word of God with the power of creation and abundance flowing through him. Everything Jesus does in Luke's gospel reflects his preference for the poor and the oppressed. But Jesus, the exorcist? What does that reveal about him? Perhaps maybe we should back up a little bit. I mean, we're just at the beginning of the gospel anyways. We've only read, if we've been, you know, gone through it from beginning to end, we've only read about 20 verses already. But perhaps we need to remember where Matthew's gospel starts or Mark's gospel starts. It, it doesn't start with a, a birth story or some kind of like ethereal creation like in John's gospel. It, it starts with Jesus right at the River Jordan, the water boundary between the wilderness and society, the place where God's voice booms as the spirit descends and the boundary between heaven and earth were torn asunder. The Greek word for the splitting of of uh, the, the clouds and the sky is just being torn apart. In this person, 
This son of God, this Jesus of Nazareth is a boundary breaking God and what better first century way to show that but with an exorcism. So if you were to read Mark's gospel from beginning to end, and I encourage you to do that, it's really an entertaining book, one would see this all over the pages of this gospel. More than any other gospel writer, Mark emphasizes Jesus' miraculous power and highlights his power to heal. He performs 18 miracles recorded in Mark's gospel. 13 of them have to do with healing, and four of them are exorcisms. Again and again throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus shows himself as the Son of God who breaks boundaries. Each and every boundary people try to put in his place, each and every boundary we think is so firmly set, God just tears apart and bursts through like that weak side linebacker that, well, anyways, there's a couple football games, right? Political, social, religious, ethical, racial, sexual, gender, cosmic, and even that final boundary we persist in thinking is beyond God's ability to shatter. Death itself. So take this exorcism story, for example. It's the Sabbath day in the synagogue, and Jesus preaches. And he ends up performing an exorcism. Where the law in Leviticus says that the ritually unclean people, like someone with an unclean spirit, is not supposed to be amongst the community. This one shows up in the middle of worship, in the middle of that entire community's gathering. And Jesus speaks a word of rebuke. When he speaks, evil falters. When Jesus acts, boundaries are broken down and the unwell are restored to wholeness and community. See, unlike this pastor, Mark's Jesus is really short on words. He rarely teaches. He does very little preaching. The longest thing he says in the entirety of Mark's gospel is this parable about a sower who scatters seed indiscriminately on all kinds of soil, hoping that some of the seed will take root and grow. Now, I'm from the Midwest. Now, granted, I'm from, I'm from Minneapolis. There's not a lot of farms there, but my wife's family grew up on a dairy farm and, and you know, did corn and wheat and soybeans and things like that. You know, farmers don't do that thing. They don't just throw seed all over the place. They prepare the rows. They put the seed in. They add nutrients. God is one of the worst farmers in the world. (laughs) Scatters seed indiscriminately and hopes that maybe at one point or another they'll take root and grow. So again and again, Mark's Jesus does things that reflect who he is. And again and again, people are amazed and incredibly baffled. Mark has Jesus feed two separate multitudes, 4,000 and 5,000, not including the women and children. And the people, especially the, the disciples, do not understand. Jesus performs miracle after miracle after miracle, and the people, especially the disciples, just don't get it. The only people who get what God is doing in Jesus are the people who are already so marginalized that God breaking a boundary is the only way they can experience grace. God in Christ keeps showing up where it seems God could never and should never be, and it baffles almost everyone. I wonder, are we that much different? I mean, we no longer equate uh, mental illness and cancer and eczema with demon possession or a result of our own sinfulness, I, I hope, but we do still make decisions about where and when God will show up. For example, most every year around this time, there is an article in some publication that says that at least one in four Americans believe God will determine the outcome of today's football games. (laughs) 
Sorry, sorry, Cowboys fans. <laughs> and about 15 years ago, a study of teenagers showed that many believe God to be a moralistic, therapeutic deity. God wants me to be happy and have a good life. God is not really important in my life unless I'm facing a problem to be solved. God wants us to be good and nice people. And good people go to heaven when they die. But I've seen this view of God in countless adults' funerals and weddings and even in myself and in daily life. If this is where we expect God to be and who we expect God to be, then maybe Mark's version of Jesus offers us a different view. Perhaps we all need a little bit of an exorcism. We need to be shown again and again, like the disciples, a God who breaks boundaries. A God who shows up when we say God does not get involved. A God who cares more about daily lives and those who suffer and die and healing and wholeness than football games. This is why Jesus performs so many miracles in Mark's gospel, to show again and again Jesus' actions reflect who he is at his core and how we respond to Jesus' actions reflect who we are at our core. This is the meaning of the heavens being ripped apart, a suffering Messiah, death on a cross and an empty tomb. And this is why our Lutheran worship again and again serves us bread and wine and says it is a feast of love and the feast of the resurrection. Again and again, we speak words of forgiveness. Why again and again, we are invited to give of our abundance, however much abundance we have, for the sake of others, in soup pots and bags of food and our very selves. You know, perhaps the greatest exorcism is not of that man in Capernaum or the other three in Mark's gospel, but it's of us who keep coming back week after week or every other week and every other week to hear those words of healing and hope again and again in word, in meal, in water, in song. Maybe we are people who need to be told again and again that God is breaking boundaries for the sake of grace. Dear siblings in Christ, we believe that the Holy Spirit empowers us to experience the presence of Christ every time we gather. Indeed, every time two of us gather, that can be anywhere in the world. May you be amazed and may you be made whole.
The creed today is the affirmation of faith from El Salvador. In this epiphany season, when Jesus is revealed to the nations as the Savior, we use creeds from global Christians. Please join me in confessing the affirmation of faith from El Salvador. In the midst of hunger and war, we celebrate the promise of plenty and peace. In the midst of oppressions and tyranny, we celebrate the promise of service and freedom. In the midst of doubt and despair, we celebrate the promise of faith and joy. In the midst of fear and betrayal, we celebrate the promise of joy and loyalty. In the midst of hatred and death, we celebrate the promise of love and life. In the midst of sin and decay, we celebrate the promise of salvation and renewal. In the midst of death on every side, we celebrate the promise of the living Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Please kneel in body or spirit. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority builds up your church in love. May all church leaders and teachers honor your instruction and model your inclusive ways. Please protect Pastor Linda Anderson Little, Caitlin Curry, Pastor Dan Anderson Little, and the other travelers from First Presbyterian Church of Garland as they strengthen our Christian bonds in Pakistan. God of grace. Renewing God, we pray for all of creation, that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces are protected, and our planet is healed. Let us commit to thoughtful care of the earth. God of grace. Justice-seeking God, we pray for those in government and community leadership, that they, lay, that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. Protect our military, especially Harrison, Tony, Aaron, Brian, Brian, China, and Brian. God of grace. Compassionate God, we pray for all in need, especially those who have known rejection any who struggle with long-term illness or chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care, and any who suffer, especially Ralph, Myron, J.D., Michael, Anthony, and our members and friends, and those we name in our hearts or aloud now. God of grace. Still speaking, God, we pray for our congregation, for its artists and musicians, for its educators and caregivers, that all gifts are used to care for those in need and to live out your example of accompaniment, gospel witness, and love. God of grace. Eternal God, we remember all who have been teachers, mentors, and companions in the church and in our lives, especially Zara Minty, Karen Chuck, Max Ashby, and Ted Bender. We trust that all who have died rest in your loving care. God of grace. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit. The peace of the risen Christ be with you always. You could turn and face the back and wave a sign of peace to those who are joining us from home and serving in the balcony, then wave a sign of peace to your neighbors.
You may be seated for the offering. Please put your attendance slip in the offering plate and you may use the QR code to give online. Let us pray together. Merciful God, receive the gifts we bring, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Through this meal, unite us as your body, shining with the light of your justice and mercy, so that others may experience your presence revealed in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is 
right to give her our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life, blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. Those worshiping from home can lift their elements with the words of institution. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you, and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Thanks be to God. All are welcome at Jesus' table, no matter your faith background or history. Please come up the center aisle to receive communion. Wine is red, grape juice is white, gluten-free wafers are available. And then return to your seats by the side aisle, throw away your cups and the cans in the front, and if you're unable to come forward, you'll be served in your seat at the end. Those worshiping at home may receive communion now. The body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us pray together. We thank you, O God, that you have strengthened our hearts through this feast of life and salvation. Shine the light of Christ on our paths that we may do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you now and forever. Amen. The God of grace dwell with you richly. Name you beloved and shine brightly on your path. In the blessing of Almighty God, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
right there. Go in peace to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. Shining light of Christ as you love, serve, and welcome all. Thanks be to God, and we love you.